Well, good morning. And first, I would like to apologize for not being with you today. But I would like to share some thoughts with you about the future of competition policy. As you all know, there have been recent suggestions to reaffirm the primacy of politics in public decision making. So, for example, in the industrial domain, there have been proposals, to be sure those proposals have stopped short of calling for a return to all style ministerial decision making, but they may put competition authorities on a tight leash by either conferring on politicians the ability to overrule the competition authorities' uh, decisions or by excluding industries or firms from the scope of competition policy. They may also grant broader missions to competition authorities like stakeholder protection, take care of the employment, environment, maybe do some industrial policy. In Europe, as you know, we have lived through the aftermath of the alstom siemens melodrama. There were pros, of course, uh, to allow the merger. The biggest company in China operates in a large and largely closed market. And there was this worry that this uh, Chinese firm will actually become dominant in Europe. And by the way, there's this issue about using competition policy or industrial policy as a second best instrument. I mean, if there's a prime with Alstom and Siemens access to the Chinese market, you will expect this to be dealt through the WTO, a dispute resolution mechanism. I grant that this is very slow, but you know, you will think that actually that will be the right channel to actually deal with this issue. And there was all this talk about rail bus, in quotes, uh, by analogy with Airbus, except that it has a very different rationale. In the case of Airbus, that was mainly about preventing Boeing from becoming a monopolist in the air manufacturing, airline ma airplane manufacturing. Now the con is of course that uh, Alstom and Siemens, at least in the short run, will have been totally dominant in signaling system and high-speed rolling stocks in the European market. Um, I haven't studied in detail. My gut feeling is that actually the, the commissioner was right in preventing the merger, but again, I haven't studied that in detail. What I would like to emphasize is my reaction to the French German proposal, giving the member state the ability to overrule uh, the competition authority in, for mergers or other decisions. And by the way, the European Union doesn't really uh, block many mergers. There are actually very few, and in some other domain, it probably should block more. Now, let me put that into the broader context, which is a population's disarray. And we see now in every country the populist using narrative to exploit, very effective narratives, to exploit the frustration of the electorate, um, maybe about the financial crisis, the eurozone crisis, the rise of unemployment, a slowdown of economic growth, uh, declining social status for the middle class, inequality, and so on. And of course, many people fear the future. They are worried about climate change, they are worried about AI and robots actually uh, taking their job, and many other things, maybe debt in some countries and unfunded pensions is a concern. Now, Politicians themselves are in disarray because they react, of course, to the electorate. So um, people dismiss experts, they want change, they look for someone who has a plan. And of course, the political market is going to respond to this demand and is responding to this demand. Now, this revisionism, as I call it, you know, the idea of you know, installing back the primacy, primacy of politics is not specific to competition policy. Take central banks, for example. The central bank independence is called into question in many countries like India, the US, Turkey, in Europe. And to be certain, there is a facilitating, facilitating factor. Central banks, after 2008, had no choice but engaging in unconventional monetary policies, which has a big financial impact and they got closer to the political decision-making in that way. That's an issue, and of course politici politicians have noticed, and it's very tempting for, that, for them to use a central bank uh, 
um, as a tool of, of policy. In some countries, even the judiciary is actually, uh, the, its independence is actually questioned. So what I'm saying here is that the questioning of competition of authority independence is actually part of a broader movement in favor of the primacy of politics. The politicians' also responses uh, are also problematic. Sometimes in some countries they pass a buck. So for example, they ask corporation to substitute for government. Of course, there is nothing wrong with corporation doing socially responsible investment. We like that. But in essence, socially responsible investment is really a decentralized approach. And especially, it's very incongruous for governments who do not dare to have any carbon price or very low carbon prices to ask businesses to, uh, to behave as if they were a carbon price. Second issue is that governments tend to pretend to act when they are not acting. Window dressing, greenwashing. We had that with COP21, for example, which had a lot of ambition, but very little in terms of concrete actions. Uh, vague promises, and in the case of a green fund, actually a collective promise, which we know never works. And now we have the pride counterpart to it, which is a statement in 2019 of the business roundtable saying we should take into account other goals than just profit, which is perfectly fine. But if, again, if you look at the number of concrete actions, there are very few. Now, sometimes government acts, and, but when they act, they may use an administered approach or in very complex uh, systems. So that's what we call, in the case of the environment, command and control. It might be industrial policy, in some countries, administrative layoff control and so on. And you know, in principle, there is nothing wrong with that, except that all those policies rely on the government having information or the officials having information that they don't have. So governments must be humble, they must design policies which fit with the kind of information that officials have. I think given the, the recent trend, it's very important to stress the rationale for agency independence. And by the way, independent agencies are never independent. Their mission, the principles are always controlled by the politicians. And the parliament can always intervene to overturn the, the policies as a whole, not in each and every instance. And that's actually what we don't want. We don't want the politicians having a lobby pushing behind, intervening in a specific instance. Now politics, and that's the role of politics, and you know, I'm not blaming politicians, but they are subject to heavy lobbying, they pander to the electorate, uh, they want to be elected. And that's why, after all, we had central bank independence in the first place. We make central banks independent because we wanted to tame inflation, and later on because we wanted to have a tougher prudential supervision. Whereas politicians are very eager to be reelected, and that leads to credit booms and inflation. Same thing with regulating telecoms, or electricity, or railroads. Uh, we have created in independent agencies. Or we have put churches in charge. So in, in, the, in, in the US, there was no privatization because the utilities, the public utilities actually were private started in 1900. But of course, it's, it was very tempted for a politician to reduce the prices so as to be popular. But that went against the investment by those utilities in infrastructure, which are a very big investment. So what was done in the US was actually to have the church protect the investments of the utilities against uh, the pandering of uh, politicians to the voters. So that's the first reason for why we want to have agency independence. There's a second reason, which, uh, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's true that agencies often have more expertise. Just think about the number of economic PhDs or other PhDs in competition authorities. Um, they usually have more expertise than, than ministries. Um, it doesn't have to be the case, but it's often the case. Now that's important for another reason I'm going to come to.
An agency, a government agency, must have a sense of mission. The government is, by a sense, the ultimate stakeholder society. That's its role. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that, but that makes the incentives very, very hard to, to set up. Because the mission is multiple and possibly fuzzy. What is this agency trying to accomplish? Which makes it difficult for the electoral process to hold officials accountable for their performance. There are, of course, issues with information of the voters, an issue with the understanding by the voters, but also if you have multiple mission, what kind of mission was the government stressing? It's, it's difficult. Now, agency in contrast they can and they need to develop a sense of mission. In my view, conglomerate agencies don't do that well. And actually, a well-managed agency may actually resist being granted new tasks because it's going to lose its sense of mission. And then I come back to the idea that actually you need professionals and experts. Uh, because those professionals, those narrow specialists, are instrumental in creating the sense of mission internally and externally at achieving intertemporal consistency, what other people would call legal certainty. And, you know, we don't know that much about the missions of agencies, but, you know, the agency series that exists suggests that having a clear mission, having advocates for certain causes, actually creates a focus and accountability, which is very much missing in the case of, of governments. And again, that's not their fault because they are the ultimate stakeholder society. Now, those missions should not be tainted by each and every consideration. You don't want to pollute an agency's mission through consideration that can be dealt with through other instruments, proper instruments. Okay? It may be complex in some cases, but you know, it's very important to realize that you, you want to um, have this sense of mission and mission should not be polluted by other consideration if possible. So for example, inequality is a very big issue nowadays. But if you start putting inequality consideration in every public policy choice, then you completely lose the focus. It's much better to deal with inequality through redistribution, through better schools, through a good health system. But when you talk about global warming, sure, the poor might be hurt by a carbon tax, but then you redistribute, you have an energy check or something like that, and you compensate those people so that they don't suffer too much. But if you don't have a carbon price, the planet is doomed. Same thing if you think about tobacco taxation. Lots of poor smoke, so you might say, we should not have a, a tax on tobacco, but that's a wrong attitude. We need a tax on tobacco to, to discourage smoking, and then we deal with inequality in other ways. Same thing, you don't want every, each and every decision to be based on the consequences on unemployment, okay? Because again, you don't have any sense of mission, you don't know what you're doing anymore. Uh, you'd rather take care of unemployment in other ways through incentives. I've been adv advocating experience rating, for example, work, you know, worker protection when they fail unemployed, but not adding a job protection mission in each and every public policy. And so on and so forth, I go, could go on, but you have to keep this sense of mission. Next, let me talk a little bit about industrial policy because it's clearly making a comeback nowadays. And just to tell you what I mean by industrial policy, um, I view two types of interventions addressing market failures. The first is what I would call humble interventions or non-targeted policies. So the government is not trying to choose winners and losers. You just give incentives. That's the example of a carbon price that I was mentioning earlier. You don't presume who could reduce pollution and who should not be reducing pollution. You just don't know. You don't bet on a specific technology uh, for green technologies. You just give a chance to every possibility. And you just give a carbon price as incentive. Same thing with R&D subsidies. 
you know, they are big spillovers of R&D, so you encourage R&D through subsidies, but they are kind of uniform. Or expediency rating, uh, where you tax firms that lay off the workers, and you don't have a judgment about whether this firm should do it or should not do it. Industrial policy, by contrast, is more ambitious, but it's also more fragile. Those are policies that are targeted towards specific sectors, technology, or even firms. And that requires more information. That's going to be our challenge. Now, industrial policy has good foundations. There are pros and there are strong arguments in flavor. So think, for example, about a cluster. A cluster is going to allow startups in a given environment and universities to share information if you have read Saxenian's book, for example, on Silicon Valley, the sharing of information is very important. Or all those stories about Steve Jobs going to Xerox Park and noticing all those discoveries. And it's true that much of what you have on your iPad or on your iPhone actually comes from the research at Xerox Park. So you share information, there is some collective learning by doing. And, very importantly, something that people often forget is that you have a local labor market. Because startups are meant to fail. Many startups should fail. That's part of the dynamics of the industry. There's a risk to be taken, and if it doesn't work, you, you shut down. But that means also that the entrepreneur and their, their collaborators, they lose their job. And it's much nicer, of course, if they can find a job locally, and of course, if you have a cluster, that's much easier than if you have only one firm in this particular town doing this kind of business. Then, in terms of public R&D, as we have seen in the US, for example, uh, you have industry spillovers from uh, public R&D, and of course, that's good for the industry as well. And sometimes there are other reasons. I already mentioned the case of Airbus, where the primary reason to start Airbus was actually to prevent Boeing uh, from becoming a monopolist, and that's a global uh, public good. Now, why is that, given that there are good reasons to do industrial policy, why is there so little support from economists as a whole, on average? So you can use an old uh, maxim, the stake picks winners, the losers pick the state. And in France, we have had lots of examples like this. Um, we have plenty of examples where this happened. But this evidence somehow is kind of anecdotal and, you know, what should we conclude out of that? It's not very scientific. And conversely, the people who are in favor of industrial policy, they will, they will cite one or two success stories, but that's not scientific either. Now, why don't they work sometimes? Well, I told you that industrial policy requires information. If you have an incompetent, incompetent, uninformed state, it's going to choose the wrong technologies, the wrong firms. And um, it's biased too. So again, in France, we have had lots of uh, examples like that where the choices, industrial choices which were made were there to protect incumbents as opposed to being the right choices. Diesel, for example, is something we are paying for now. And often both. So you go to, to to, I've been in those meetings where the minister has said we need 34 or 12 industrial plans, priority programs, tell us which ones. And of course, all the lobbies come in, nobody's informed about anything except his or her specialty. And it's just a lobbying activity with absolutely no information uh, to assess what should be done. But there are success too, successes too. So, an interesting role model, actually, is the U.S. You would not expect the U.S. to be a role model for industrial policy. Uh, with DARPA, with the NIH, with the NSF, and you know, much of what has happened in information technologies and biotech in the U.S., where they are, they are leaders, actually come from industrial policy. So, what is that that did right? In my book, Economics for the Common Good, I make eight recommendations. The first is kind of obvious. Think about the market failure. We have to know what we are trying to do and why we are intervening. The second is to use independent, independent high-level experts. And you give them a lot of discretion. That's what DARPA has done. It's not easy because you have to find 
high level experts who also are independent, but by and large you give them discretion. And that's also the way peer reviewed panels work. The third recommendation is to look at both supply and demand. You often have a demand, which is legitimate. So a municipality or region wants to have a cluster in cancer, in biotech, or in green energies. But they rarely ask whether they have what it takes to make it happen. So do I have the scientists who are going to bring students, who are going to start startups, and is it going to happen? It's not because you have a building and, and, and money that you'll be successful. That's what I call the field of dream mentality. The field of dream mentality comes from this movie in which Kevin Costner was playing and he had a voice saying that if he builds a baseball field, then the players will come. Now, in the middle of Iowa. Now in the movie, uh, Shoeless George Jackson comes, of course, and, and the others come, but in the real world they don't. So you need to have uh, the, the players who are going to make it happen. Then you, recommendation, recommendation number four, you adopt a competitively neutral policy. Five, you don't prejudge a solution. You set an objective. DARPA was also very good at doing that. You don't decide which green technology is going to win. Six is obvious, but rarely done. You evaluate programs exposed. And when they don't work, you stop them. It's very important also to redistribute the money to more successful uh, undertaking. So you have to stop. There is no shame in stopping. You involve the private sector in risk-taking so as to avoid what elephant. And since I'm a lobby, you strengthen universities. But I'm serious here too, because if you have strong universities, you can also have startups around those universities. So let me conclude with a few notes about improving antitrust. This is not easy, I'm not going to give you any deep insight. We don't need new laws, we need more guidance. So take an example, which is common ownership by institutional investors. As you all know, in the US in particular, um, BlackRock and State Street and, and many others actually are owning all the firms in an oligopoly, in the airline business, in the banking business and so on. And of course there is a danger that they, because they are active investors, they actually intervene in governance to prevent firms competing on each other's territories or they, they are going to use absolute performance evaluation instead of relative performance evaluation which is conducive to more competition and so on and so forth. It's called a cartel. Um, we already have the laws, starting with the Sherman Act, starting with Section 7 of the Clayton Act. We don't need new laws. What we need is guidelines, because BlackRock and Fidelity and all those institutional investors, they have to know what they can do and cannot do. They want to diversify, and that's why also they buy uh, shares in many firms or securities in many firms more generally. Um, so one possibility is you tell them you have to be passive. That's no good because precisely you count on them to be active in governance and monitor, monitor management. You can use legal challenges, but it's complicated because whether you're guilty of being in a cartel depends on what the other people do as well, like what other investors do. So it's, it's very hard to, to do. Maybe impose some limits on diversification. So for example, some have proposed to you can invest only in one firm per industry. You lose a little bit in terms of diversification, but not that much. Whatever. Um, what we need as an economics profession is actually to design better guidelines to help those firms actually be active investors in the industry without violating antitrust. Second example, best price guarantees, so MFNs, most favored nation clauses. Now we all know now, after a few years of research, that um, best price guarantees have the potential to be anti-competitive. So they allow platforms to tax their competitors through a single price, the fees pass through not only to the customer of the platform but also to, um, to the customer of other platforms or direct customer of, of the hotels or the airlines and so on. So we don't like best price guarantees 
at the same time, we must recognize that there also are virtues. So, for example, there is what's called showrooming. You don't want me to go to booking.com and find the hotel I want, and then, because it's a little bit cheaper on the hotel website, then leave booking.com and actually go uh, to the hotel website, because then I expropriate booking.com from its investment. There's also, that's when you have low search costs, it's very easy for me to switch. Uh, conversely, if, when you have very high search costs, most favored nation causes also prevent surcharging. We have seen that in, in credit cards. So we need better guidelines. So, so far, what we have done is structural interventions. In France, in Germany, in the UK, in Sweden, in Europe more generally, we have prohibited narrow or broad MFNs. Um, the, it's just a rough policy. In principle, we like to set price cap. It would be more efficient, but we don't have the guidelines for that. Uh, partly because academics is lagging behind. Now, in the case of payment card in the EU, we found a rule, which is called the tourist test, which basically caps the, the merchant's uh, fee uh, at the merchant's convenience benefit. But that's only one particular industry in which we have found a way of dealing with a non-structural intervention. Example three, preemptive mergers. So something we are very worried about right now is incumbents buying up all the startups, uh, which in turn may actually lead to entry for buyouts. So basically the startup enter just to blackmail the incumbent, buy me, otherwise I will compete. And this is really something that doesn't create social value. So there's been potential suppression of price competition, for example, in the case of the purchase of Instagram and WhatsApp by Facebook. Uh, sometimes the product itself may even be su suppressed. So the, well, that's called the killer acquisition. There is some evidence of that in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and that obviously is something that is anti-competitive. Another cost of that is that it directs innovation toward Me Too innovation. So Me Too innovations are really uh, can be quite profitable because uh, you are purchased by the incumbent and you, know, you make money out of that without creating social value. Now, now, now it's impossible actually to challenge such mergers because there is no evidence. Instagram and WhatsApp had hardly sold anything. They were not quite doing the same thing as Facebook. Same thing, some, some of those uh, drugs or molecules actually haven't been tested yet. They may, may not have even gone through the FDA approval process. So an econometrician just cannot tell whether it's an anti-competitive merger. So the proposal, which I think is really reasonable but has its own dangers, is to shift the burden of proof in that kind of merger to incumbents. So whenever you have an incumbent buying someone with actually doing something similar early in the process so that you cannot have any evidence of anti-competitive behavior, then it's up to the incumbent actually to prove that's a good merger. But that requires a fair amount of trust in the antitrust authorities, but I don't see any other way around. So that will be shifting uh, the burden of proof to dominant firms early in the product life cycle. We may want to improve processes um, we, we all know the drawbacks of uh, standard approaches. Self-regulation is, of course, self-serving. Competition policy is too slow, too late. Utility regulation is mostly infeasible for the tech industry because those firms are global, so they cannot be regulated by a single regulator because you don't follow them along the life cycle. So it's completely different. You cannot just apply public utility regulation to uh, the big tech companies the way we have done it for telecom, railroads, or electricity companies. And then industrial policy, of course, uh, which I've discussed at length. So what we may want to try to, to achieve is some kind of participative antitrust, where the industry and experts, I should have added experts here, actually make proposals to the competition authority and the competition authority reacts through business review letters, evolving guidelines, rules. 
But for that, of course, the competition policy must admit that it may be wrong. So, you know, here's my gut feeling, here's what I think at day t, but at day t plus 10, I may, or t plus 1, I may, I may actually change my mind. That gives more flexibility, that minimizes legal uncertainty, and you use industry's information and ideas, but of course in an independent way. My favorite case of that is patent pools. I mean, the work that DOJ in the US has done on patent pools and then other agencies as well um, is remarkable because we know that patent pool has a huge potential actually to be pro-competitive and reduce price, but they can also be anti-competitive. And this competition within the IP owner uh, industry uh, can be dangerous. So the idea of the DOJ, which, which has been improved since, is basically to say, okay, that's fine, but you do X, Y, and Z. And then that becomes guidelines. So that's a very good example of what I think is a good policy. Let me give you another example. Collective negotiation in mobile payments. Um, wallet providers, they control the near field control. Um, so they are kind of bottleneck. And the card issuer in that case has very little bargaining power. Maybe the platform develops a reputation for not negotiating. Maybe it's card or multi-homing or whatnot. So the solution which has been implemented in Canada or China is basically collective negotiation. It makes sense, but you've, I'm sure everybody in the room feels uneasy about that. Why? Because there is a possibility of anti-competitive boycott, which is, of course, prohibited by Section 1 of the Sherman Act or Article 101 in Europe. Uh, the process, therefore, must be approved and supervised. It's just like for patent pools. It can be dangerous, but it can be also very useful. Regulatory sandbox is another example where we try things, we learn by doing. I think we have to be humble. Uh, and this approach, I think, is a better approach. But of course, it requires a lot of trust in the expertise and the independence of antitrust authorities. So let me conclude here and uh, with a couple of take-home points. Competition policy independence is worth fighting for. It has to be earned, and we have to improve, we, the antitrust practitioners, the academics, everyone, has to try to contribute to improve the economic foundation and the procedures. As for industrial policy, it can be considered. There's nothing wrong theoretically with that. But if you want to do it, you must respect due process. And this due process, by the way, may require independence. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you a very, very productive conference. Thank you.